Okay, hustle volume for folks. Good. All right, awesome. Hi, everybody. My name is Liberty. I'm part of the Firestorm Collective. Um, and this is actually the first hybrid event we've ever done. So before we get started, maybe I'll just mention that. Um, we do have some folks who are joining remotely. Um, and in addition, we have a really nice full house. Um, so thanks to everybody who showed up on this like actually kind of crummy day where it would have been really easy to just stay at your at, in your own private space and read a book or something. Um, so I'm really appreciative that you're not doing that and say you're here with us. Um, we are uh, gonna have um, uh, a little bit of a panel discussion and then I think some opportunity for Q and A and I'm gonna do my best to bring in questions from folks who are not present in the room with us in addition to I'm sure the great questions that folks who are here are gonna have. So for anybody who is joining in virtually, uh, you know, feel free to use the Q and A tool in the Zoom app uh, to submit questions and I will keep an eye on that. Um, so just briefly, Firestorm is an almost 16 year old worker cooperative uh, run by a queer feminist collective here in Asheville on the land of the Cherokee people. Um, and we host a lot of community events. So if you're not familiar with our calendar, I would definitely uh, check it out. You can look on our website. We post about stuff on social media and we have a newsletter. So find us somewhere. Um, it's really exciting and special to get to host a book event for a book that's both on a topic that I think we care about and are excited about, and also a book that has local contributors and centers in terms of its narrative to a large extent on our community. So it's kind of this incredible alignment of things, which is so rare. Um, do we actually have a copy of the book up here? We <laughs> here we are at the front of the room without copies <laughs> of the book. Perfect. Oh, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Your <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Books through bars, yay! <laughs> um, uh, and I am going to let these uh, these fine folks tell you more about that book and its genesis. But first, I'm going to give them a quick introduction. Um, uh, holding the book today, we've got uh, Mac Marquis, who's a lifelong uh, activist. He's worked with the concerned family and friends of Mumia Abu Jamal, Earth First, and the Asheville Global Report. Shout out to anyone who remembers the Asheville Global Report. Uh, yeah, uh, he has established Apple Prison Books as well as Saxabaha Prison Books. Mac is the co-review editor uh, for H Labor and executive assistant for the Labor and Working Class History Association. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of South Carolina um, and co-editor of this fine book. Thanks for being here, Mac. Thank you. Uh, Julie Schneer is a prison abolitionist working with Asheville Prison Books since 2011, old timer. Uh, <laughs> Julie also participates in numerous groups challenging state repression, including the Asheville Community Bail Fund and the Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross. Uh, she holds a master's degree in literacy, culture, and language education, and teaches reading and math to adult learners. Thanks for being here, Julie. Also not mentioned in this bio is a longtime participant in our collective here at Firestorm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then finally, um, Eliza from uh, Transmission Prison Project, which is a queer and trans powered prison abolition organization that provides free books, zines, and other forms of support to incarcerated members of the LGBTQ plus community nationwide. PPP is a 100% volunteer non-hierarchical organization and Eliza's been involved in some form or another since 2018. Thank you so much for being here. All right, I'm gonna turn it over. Uh, I'm so excited to hear this conversation and so appreciative uh, to all of y'all for being here. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I think uh, I'll go ahead and start and then I'll pass the mic off to my fellow panelists here. And I just wanna take a second and thank Firestorm for making this happen. I also want to say that this book would not be possible without my co-editor Moira and all of the people who contributed chapters and artwork, including my fellow panelist Julie. And I also want to thank uh, Eliza for Eliza's participation today, uh, but also all the people who volunteered for prison books over the years. And of course, to all the people who fought for the rights of incarcerated people. When you crack the book open, I hope that you'll be struck by the art 
and the stories. It's an attempt to allow the people who've been a part of this movement or affected by incarceration to tell the story of why it matters. I guess the easiest way to start out is to give a general framing of the book, and then uh, we can talk about Asheville, Tri Asheville prison books and transmission respectively. Uh, and perhaps if we have time, we're so, we'll circle back to the national movement. So this book is about a social movement that in many ways has flown under the radar for well over 50 years. The prison books movement is comprised of a disparate group of people who sent free books to incarcerated people. Over the last several decades, this movement has sent hundreds of thousands of free books inside, answered hundreds of thousands of letters from people asking for free books. Collectively, these programs are the largest secular, not-for-profit endeavor to get reading material into the hands of incarcerated people. And to the best of my knowledge, there's been no work that's been that's attempted to document the history of this movement and to introduce this movement as a whole to the general public. One of the reasons why this movement has likely flown under the radar is because of the population that we serve. A population that's designed to remain invisible and forgotten by the general public. And of course, here I'm talking about incarcerated people. This movement, the, the people in this movement refuse to not see and refuse to forget our fellow citizens. This is particularly important in the United States because we have the largest rate of incarceration per capita in the world. In other words, we imprison our citizens at a higher rate than anyone else in the world. According to Prison Policy Institute, there's currently about 1.9 million people incarcerated in the United States, and black and brown people are disproportionately incarcerated. Some states like New Jersey have a discrepancy rate as high as 12 to 1, meaning black and brown citizens are 12 times as likely to be incarcerated as white citizens in those states. So ask yourselves, is there, is there something in particular about Americans that predisposes them to criminality? Are we just a degenerate nation? Or is there something wrong with a system that turns its citizens into criminals? But let's shift back to the book. In the first part of the book, our authors talk about some of the needs for prison books programs, clarifying that these programs are indeed necessary and that they serve the needs of people whose needs are not currently being met by the state or through private enterprise. In other parts of the book, we discuss censorship and some obstacles to teaching and learning inside. So there are sections written by Vicki Law, giving a general overview, Michelle Dillon, Rebecca Ginsburg, and others on censorship. And we discuss the experiences of teaching inside, as well as the perspective of formerly incarcerated people speaking about the obstacles to learning and their relationship between students and teachers on the inside. We also talk about the origin stories of some of these prison books organizations, including Asheville Prison Books and Appalachian Prison Books Project. The interview with Lorenzo Comba Irvin clarifies that this movement was begun by incarcerated people. We also talk about some of the efforts of the movement as a whole and, and how we've organized to cooperate and communicate among prison books programs. And of course, we have interviews with some formerly incarcerated people expressing the need for the importance or the need and importance of books on the inside. We give various insights into the ways in which people can start their own prison books programs, including a wonderful comic uh, that gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to start your own program. And finally, we end with discussions of these issues uh, and how the, the issues these programs are currently facing and what it might mean for them in the future. And I'll explain what a typical program does, and then we can circle back around to the movement as a whole. Most prison books programs are volunteer run and staffed. We get books donated to us. We fundraise to purchase what we need. Typically, we try to find space that is free or cheap, and we can house our books, a place where we can house our books and package them. We get letters from incarcerated people asking for books and hands down, the most commonly requested book is a dictionary. Most people are surprised by that. And I think that surprise results from a lack of understanding that many people incarcerate, many people on the inside are indeed looking for ways 
and make their lives better, to educate themselves on the inside. And that's no easy task while incarcerated. For the record, functional literacy rates are high within the prison system. Estimates are as high as 60% of people on the inside are functionally illiterate. So people need these dictionaries to teach themselves and others how to read. This, of course, relates back to issues of who is incarcerated and highlights how much of our education, how much our educational system has been defunded and the failures that that neglect breeds. But reading the desires, but the reading desires of incarcerated people go well beyond dictionaries and other forms of self-help. There's other commonly requested books for genres, genres such as urban fiction, westerns, African American history, thrillers, it really runs the gamut. And we do our best to fill those requests, but we don't always have the exact book someone wants. And that's kind of the baseline for most programs. But there are many other materials that we try to stock and send inside, things such as the National Prisoners Resource List or NPRL. The NPRL provides incarcerated people with many useful contacts and addresses so that incarcerated people who get the NPRL might have access to reading and writing programs, access to information about college classes while incarcerated, art programs, health programs such as AIDS and HIV support, pen pals, legal aid organizations. In short, many useful contacts for incarcerated people can be found in the NPRL. Many organizations also stock reentry guides. These are critical for people who are approaching the end of a mandated incarceration. These guides work to make returning citizens aware of the resources that they might have access to. And the lack of resources for these folks is appalling and definitely plays a, a role in the high recidivism rates in the United States. But that's really kind of another topic altogether. Another function of these programs is that they, that they, these programs serve is that they allow people who have friends and family who are incarcerated, the ability to send them books without having to purchase them. These folks can also volunteer and gain a sense of community through working with other folks, and they be, get in contact with folks who might understand the particular issues that they're facing, the problems, the obstacles, uh, and find support within that community. And that's something that type of support is generally terribly lacking in our society. And another intervention these programs make is that incarcerated folks who package the books also tend to write a brief note. We also tend to write a brief note to the incarcerated people. This may seem like a small thing to folks who do not have an understanding of the prison system. However, for some folks who are incarcerated, this is the only outside personal contact they may have had in years. So a handwritten letter from someone letting you know that you're not forgotten might mean the world. And the books play a similar role. The books are a tangible piece of evidence that folks on the outside care enough to send you something that they think you might need. In some cases, something you specifically asked for, if we can get it. This is just the type of thing that may help someone make it through another day. And finally, prison books programs are important for the volunteers as well. For many of us, it's a way to make a positive intervention and attempt to bring some small relief to incarcerated people. At programs that I've been involved with, we did our best to make these projects as enjoyable as possible. I mean, I know that sounds odd in some ways in juxtaposition to the carceral system, but the point is that you're doing something, that you are attempting to bring hope and light into a desperate situation. It's a way to maintain humanity in the face of an inhumane system. All too often, activists can kind of fall into a martyr complex of sorts. So yes, we we always did our best to make things, to bring a little levity to our organizations. And frankly, more people volunteer and more books get inside if you can spread some joy in the process. So to wrap this part up, this book tells the story of many of the various organizations that do this work. And unfortunately, much of this history has been lost or is not remembered. However, I hope that the book leads former volunteers to come out of the woodwork and tell their stories and her pushes researchers to uh, uncover a more fuller story. I should say that another reason this history is not more well known is that the people involved in these programs have by and large been poor and working class folks, and most of the volunteers have full-time jobs. And frankly, for the most part, this is just a small aspect of their general abolitionist work. Setting books inside is something that we do in the short term 
while our eyes are on the prize of abolition. That is not the case. That every prison books program is inherently an abolition, abolitionist program, but there are many abolitionists involved in prison books programs. And I know I'm running up against the clock for my part of this talk, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Julie or Eliza, who would like to talk next about either Asheville prison books or transmission. Hey y'all, it's really good to be here with everyone. Thanks to Mac and Liza and Firestorm um, and all of you for supporting the book and supporting the work. And I do literally mean supporting the work because so many of the people in the audience are people who have done prison books and PPP here in town. Uh, so um, I guess I'll highlight uh, a little bit of kind of my story with uh, prison books because that does stretch back as it was noted um, to like 2011. Um, and I think that gives you a good sense of how long this project has been going. Technically, we've been in operation since 1999, um, when Matt here was one of the co-founders of that project. And hopefully he can, I know, probably ask you later a little bit, if you'll say a little bit about what super, super early uh, Asheville Prison Books looked like. But when I rolled up in 2011, uh, we were in the basement of someone's house in Montford, was where our uh, office was. And I was able to, I had heard about prison books uh, in New York where I was living before I moved here and had just gotten involved. And when I moved to Asheville, my number one thing was like, I want to see if there's a prison books chapter here. Lo and behold, there was. And thank goodness it was walking distance from my house because I did not have a car. <laughs> um, and so I found myself going to the basement of Star House uh, many times a week. And um, at that time, there was not a lot of interaction between different volunteers. We often didn't see each other, but you would kind of know that things were getting done because you would go in and it was almost like secret little mice, kind of. <laughs> it was like you'd go in and there would be a stack of books and there'd be no stack of books. And I didn't know what was happening to them. <laughs> the downstream uh, workflow was not clear to me, but I would see that it would start going out. Um, and then less and less was going out. And it seems like things had become a little more dormant. And eventually we moved the, uh, we had to leave that space. And that is one of the kind of, if you read the book and especially the chapters about Asheville, you'll see that a constant struggle for the project has been needing to move spaces over and over and over again. And I know that our project is not unique in that. Um, among the dozens of projects nationwide, this is a constant theme having to find another place because as Max mentioned, we're always trying to do things on such a budget um, that paying for space is often not an option. So we go where we can be. So we, were, we moved the space, uh, thank goodness, to Downtown Books and News, which was a huge win for the project. Uh, we made us a lot more public, a lot more visible because you can't like put someone's home address on your website. <laughs> So when we were now in a physical uh, location that was like more commercial in nature, we could be more welcoming to the wider community. Um, when I first got involved, it was a lot more of a subcultural project, which is also a kind of theme in these spaces. Uh, not all of them, but many of them started or continue to be largely uh, subcultural oftentimes predominantly young, predominantly white, predominantly anarchist or left-leaning politics. Um, and that's something that we've seen shift a little bit over the life of the project. Um, I think it's an interesting ways that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but kind of the big mm, turning point, I would say, or a big turning point in the life of the project was in 2017 when Basically, it seemed like prison books had stopped happening, um, even though there was an office and there were technically things in place. I would go in and I would see that, you know, nothing had been done since the last time I'd been there. Boxes were piled up. They weren't getting mailed out. Um, and it kind of just seemed like the project had slowly, quietly died. <laughs> um, and event there was, for a time, I had tried to 
kind of like work extra to, to catch up on things. But I think our letterbox was like a year out or something, um, which is sounds egregious, but is also not completely un, unheard of. Um, and I told some comrades that this is what was going on and that I felt like the project maybe was just ending, which felt really bad but it was also a reality <clears throat> and it didn't seem responsible to pretend that it was still a thing when it no work was happening. Um, and kind of in just an amazing show of solidarity, the people who I was with at the time were like, well, we can't let that happen, <laughs> you know? Um, and realized what an institution, you know, actual prison books had become in town where, it, you know, every year the there's a, uh, very high profile punk cover band show every year on Halloween. Uh, so they're the kind of like touchstones in Asheville culture, especially for some of us slightly older people, um, that it just seemed unthinkable that the project could uh, could really be ending. And so we made sure it didn't and really poured on the juice in terms of uh, not just like us doing all the work, but actually building out the capacity of the organization to do more. And that looked like volunteer outreach and development. Um, and we just, we did a lot of voluntary orientations and we brought a lot of new people in uh, kind of quickly. And that was a lot of effort, but it was worth it because it made it, it didn't just make it possible to continue doing the project. I mean, that was the most important part, but it also made the project better. <laughs> uh, and I think that's where the idea of like, you know, kind of, I think Mac talked about like what we do. It's, it's, I can ask, answer specific questions if people are interested in the nuts and bolts of how we do what we do. But, you know, basically we get letters from people. We have a donated library of books. We match those books and letters requested and then we mail them out. That's like the core of the work. But why we do it is really different for different people in the organization. Um, and, I think the homogeneity, maybe politically, uh, in previous years, sometimes the, that kind of you know affinity-based subcultural uh, work can be really effective. If you have a crew of you know six to ten people who are really committed and all have a similar ideology, and this is you know your main form of activism, you can get a lot done. So I'm not knocking that, but for Asheville Prison Books, for whatever reason, uh, over time shifted to really the win was opening up and being more embedded with a wider swath of community. Um, and that is pretty much how we've been since then. Um, and it's been really lovely and people have brought in all kinds of different uh, perspectives and experiences and resources. Uh, we really kind of increased our effectiveness, not just like per person, but it, it became a lot more than the sum of its parts. Um, so maybe I'll pause there and hand it to Eliza and, uh, we'll go from there. Hi everybody. I'm happy to be here representing Transmission Prison Project, which we also call TPP, kind of interchangeably. There's another organization in town called Transmission that is easily confused, so. TPP. Um, my understanding of the project is that it started around 2002 or 2003 as a sort of niche breakaway from the actual prison books for a group. Um, we have always shared the same space and a lot of the same resources, but there were some people at that time who saw a need to specifically source material for LGBTQ people in prison. Um, so whether that's history, medical resources, erotica, anything in the realm of LGBTQ support and literature, um, that is like the niche that we spend as much time and energy on as possible. Um, we also don't limit ourselves to just North Carolina or South Carolina. We accept letters from all over the country, which I, I believe in the early days of TPP felt like 
the best thing to do because it was so niche. But as our name has become more well known and word of mouth has spread, um, the amount of requests we get goes up exponentially. Um, so that poses some problems in like how to streamline. We because we get requests for all types of literature, and we don't like to turn any letters away if we can. Um, yeah, so very much born out of the same principles and context as APB. And there's a lot of overlapping volunteers as well, um, especially since we share the same space and pretty much the same process for replying to letters. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any other questions specifically, but that's just a little blurb about transmission. So I did want to take a second and talk a little bit about the history of these movements. And I will say that uh, in his interview, Lorenzo Pomba Urban wanted to, in his interview in the text, he wanted to make it clear that uh, these were driven by incarcerated people, that incarcerated people were the ones who were driving this demand for books and making the changes that allowed them to receive the material inside. And I wanna go back to that a little bit and say that uh, a lot of programs kind of owe an intellectual debt to a man by the name of Martin Sostry who uh, mounted some lawsuits in the 1960s and, so Street versus uh, McGinnis in 64. There's also So Street versus Rockefeller. And these were lawsuits that uh, So Street mounted to gain access uh, in part to reading materials. But there is a long history that kind of precedes that, that you can, you know, these things don't happen in a vacuum, right? I mean, the, the work for incarcerated people and the connection between uh, people advocating for and with incarcerated people and, and the connection between radical politics, you can, it goes very far back. I mean, you can, the foundation of the ACLU and, you know, is in response in part to the Red Scare. Dave, do you want to get that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Dave's got a call, so we'll wait. Um, but, uh, but, so, in the in the 19 but moving forward in the 1950s uh, coming out of world war ii there was a lot of uh, work being done on the inside among incarcerated people as the nature of incarceration was changing and becoming more draconian uh, there were a lot of prison riots in multiple states uh, during the 50s this, and here i'm kind of relying on the work of garrett felber and some others uh, to kind of remember this history and so Sostri and others kind of are coming out of that environment uh, where people on the inside are being very politically active and moving things forward on the inside. Uh, and Sostri in particular, his connection to is through the Nation of Islam. Uh, the Nation of Islam was very active uh, working for prisoners and, and were indeed, there were many uh, incarcerated people who were members of the Nation of Islam at this point in time. And Sostri was one of those people. And so he's advocating for materials such as the Quran uh, and religious materials as you know that, that he's advocating for and trying to gain access to. In many states, the only book you were allowed was the Bible and the King James Bible in particular, right? And so these lawsuits kind of open up the door for other reading materials to uh, be allowed on the inside. And I should say that also uh, Irvin makes it clear that this is also happening in conjunction with the civil rights movement, with the Black Power movement, with other things on the outside, right? And that the the movement from the inside is being supported by radicals on the outside, and that that connection was important and was part of what moved this forward. Now, in terms of prison books groups in particular, again, we're still trying to uncover much of that very specific history, but three of the oldest programs that we can kind of date all originated right around 1972, 1973. And I don't think that, I don't think that it uh, would be inappropriate to suggest that there's a connection between that timeline and the Attica prison rebellion, right? I think that there's, there's a palpable connection there as these issues get brought to the forefront nationally. And I think that 
Uh, so these programs, one comes right out of uh, Durham, North Carolina, and that's in 1972. And that one has more of a, that one's kind of an interfaith movement. Uh, and then the other two, one is in Massachusetts and one is in Seattle. And both of those had more of a radical leftist kind of bent and were associated with radical bookstores at the time. And Martin Soster himself had owned a radical bookstore, right? So there is this long connection for these groups. And so I was asked to kind of talk a little bit more about the connection between uh, radicalism and kind of the origins of these movements and, and this uh, prison books programs in general. So uh, I was gonna ask Julie, if you can talk a little bit more about uh, Asheville prison books and kind of the issues that you currently face with Asheville prison books. Yeah, thank you for that question. And I also want to just kind of jumping off something you said too. Something that I was struck by that I learned from the interview with Lorenzo in the book is that not only did the prisoner, not only was it a prisoner-led struggle because of lawsuits just making it possible to receive books, but that at first all of the books were coming from publishers, like they were writing directly to publishers and the target of what they wanted to get in looked super different from how it is now. Everything that we said about how diverse the genres and everything are, it was very different back then. They were specifically trying to get revolutionary literature about Black identity, Chicano identity, as the term was used at the time, uh, feminism. So it was uh, inherently a political education project that was taking place on the inside and outside um, in conjunction. And that's really different today because of mass incarceration and the way that the prison population certainly still reflects radical strains of radicalism for sure. But you have, you know, millions of people, you may know, heard these statistics before. I always like to repeat them because they are shocking and they should continue to be shocking. Um, that between the 70s and the, you know, time that the prison population peaked in what was it like 2010 or something. Um, the prison population quintupled. It quintupled. <laughs> um, so that doesn't happen without also a shift of like the type of people who are incarcerated and the kinds of stuff that they need. So they went from needing radical literature to needing literally everything. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to add that. Uh, so the question about actual prison books and what we see today actually is a good segue from that because what we're seeing now is that we've had so many years now of this kind of like detente <laughs> between outside supporters and prison administrators where we've been able to send stuff in uh, that they're actually starting to roll that stuff back. And so a lot of our projects um, are frequently getting challenges to our ability to send things in. And not just uh, in terms of the content of the books, people often associate and think, oh, censorship. Censorship does happen for sure uh, in terms of content. We've had some very interesting experiences where, uh, for instance, we tried to send in a book called My Sister the Serial Killer, which is just like a cool, fun, well-written mystery thriller, um, but it happens to be written by a Nigerian woman, and uh, they did not like the idea of a mystery thriller in which men are stabbed. It was rejected specifically for the reason of stabbings of men <laughs> that was objectionable as opposed to the appropriate target of stabbings <laughs> was obviously women um so so that does happen but the much bigger problem is actually the blanket bans on our projects whereby they start to say after you know 10 15 20 years of us sending stuff in suddenly that day we're not allowed to anymore and then it is incumbent on us, a group of volunteers who are already, you know, doing all of our paid work and then our unpaid work at prison books. And now we have a third job of fighting this administrative and legal apparatus uh, and trying to convince them that we're legitimate enough to send in free books to people. So that is happening a lot, and it is happening in conjunction with the intensification of surveillance, like technologically infused surveillance apparatuses. Um, so by that, I mean um, all of the systems, most of which are privatized, that come in and kind of hone in on a particular piece of the communications apparatus, whether that's the phone, 
the mail. Now they've got tablets, um, all of which are monitored and monetized. And all of this is happening and it's allowing um, greater surveillance of both the people who are incarcerated because now everything's digitized and they can just scoop up all the data um, as well as the people that they're communicating with on the outside. Uh, they're trying to use the pretext of people having access to tablets in order to say, well, they don't need free books from, from people anymore on the outside because they've got tablets. Um, but of course, the content on those tablets is it's not like just like the normal internet. Um, so they have access to a certain database of books, but those books are not necessarily what people want. And that also is another avenue of them trying to shut down communication between the inside and the outside because one of the things that we get in our letters is like a human connection. It's not just, I want these books and then we send the books. Um, there's a lot more to it. And just the feeling of reaching out individually to people who are reading and then sending you something is a huge thing. We constantly are told this every day in letters. So we know it's true. Um, the idea of getting a mail call and having them you know, yell out your name and get, receiving a pass it, package means something on the inside. Um, so all of that is happening, and in conjunction with that, they're also trying to uh, say that prison book projects are sending in contraband. Um, the main one is usually that uh, the pages of the books have liquefied drugs on them, <laughs> is the, the main, <laughs> uh, which is not true. And they have never been able to document a single instance of this ever. Um, and yet it persists. Like they continue to, to ban and send things back. Uh, we've challenged them on it. National folks have, in allied organizations have challenged them on it. Uh, but it's always a struggle. So that's the, that's the latest. <laughs> We're just trying to keep doing what we do. And they just make it harder and harder every year. Oh, and... Co uh, rolling lockdowns since COVID have been a huge problem just for people inside in general. We're getting a higher volume of mail because people are locked down more frequently for arbitrary reasons. Um, and so people are just constantly writing to us now, like our volume has gone up by 50% over the past few years. It's really extreme uh, because people just are not getting out of their cells. Uh, even if they're not assigned to SEG or anything like that, they're just not getting out of their cells. The libraries are not functioning. People aren't getting out for rec time. There's, and we're constantly hearing this more and more. So the, the conditions inside are getting worse. And that's when we get more letters. Thank you. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, censorship that y'all are facing in transmission as well, or any current difficulties in that. After Eliza talks about that, we'll open it up to a QA. Yeah. I would say every layer of censorship or invisibility or, or stigma that prison books projects face in general, or anyone who's sending anything inside of a prison faces, there's another layer of that when it's related to LGBTQ material. Um, that's definitely like a huge area of concern and, and a constant conversation we're having is like how to send material discreetly. And a lot of material doesn't necessarily come with a discreet cover. So we're always looking for like kind of underground methods of getting our material inside. We've had people in the past who have been able to like rebind books for us with more neutral covers, it's very helpful, um, or taking off like the sleeves of books. And yeah, so as far as content, there's definitely a layer of like just the nature of what we're sending in is more likely to get rejected, period. Um, but the same sort of blanket ban on our organization as a whole has definitely become an increasing problem. There was a, a while, at least five or six years, that we were banned in the state of North Carolina. And our way of getting around that was also kind of underground. We would just send underneath APB's name or Downtown Books and News's name 
And it was a really convenient loophole to still be able to communicate with people who are incarcerated in North Carolina. And then we found out by someone who was a repeat writer that they had talked to the warden or something that we weren't banned there anymore. So we, we found out that we weren't banned in North Carolina by the people who write to us. Um, and the, I, I guess this is related somehow, but particularly since COVID, more and more institutions are moving to like publisher only or vendor only as another way to kind of blanket ban prison books projects as a whole. And that has forced us to try this method of sending under downtown books and news. And that's worked for a while. We've noticed just in the last month or two that our rate of returns from certain states where that was working is not working anymore. Um, Texas is a really big example. Probably a quarter of the letters we receive are from people in Texas. And they are starting to make it really hard to get our name and our books there. So that's kind of but one of the top problems that we're facing at the moment is this vendor only campaign. Um, yeah. Well, I was wondering, do you, I don't know if you know, but are you all the only nationwide like LGBTQ focused project? There's one more in Wisconsin. Um, their focus is more regional, mid yeah Midwest region, um, but that's the only other one I know of that's LGBTQ specific. Yeah, and we have we have a library of particularly zines that um, are our priority for getting out there. Things like roadmap for transitioning while in prison, or how to survive prison as a trans woman. That were all of these things were written by people who were incarcerated. And I don't have the, the historical context for transmission to know how we acquired those, where they came from, but I'm very glad that we have them preserved. And that's kind of the main type of thing that we prioritize sending because I don't know where else you would get that information if you needed it. Indeed, I think that uh, the the banning of programs and the creation of obstacles for programs to send things inside, you know, the approved vendor status and things like that are, that's a continual problem. I'll be talking in Athens uh, in a few days at a bookstore that currently has a lawsuit uh, challenging that that status in the state of Georgia. So there, there are people actively fighting this and that's, they're not a prison books program, but they do send books inside. And so they are uh, suing for the right to be able to be considered a, an approved vendor. And many often, you know, oftentimes that these are really arbitrary. And when you challenge an institution uh, about, you know, how do you become an approved vendor, all of a sudden things begin to fall apart for the, for the state because they don't actually have a process by which you can become an approved vendor or the process is something that you could achieve, right? And so, when they're forced to defend that, oftentimes uh, there's an avenue for programs to kind of uh, win those lawsuits. So we're hoping that uh, that will be the experience of Avid Books in Georgia. Uh, but let's go ahead and open it up for a Q&A. Uh, so I also volunteer with the Transmission Prison Project, and this is a question that um, specifically for Eliza, I guess. Um, what, uh, how do you navigate um, letters coming in of folks who are not out as queer um, inside and how do you get them the resources that they need without um, outing them, basically? Um. We've never questioned anyone who's writing us. It's just sort of assumed that if you're writing us, even if you're not requesting queer specific material, that you found our name for a reason. Um, and I guess that's become a little bit of a question lately, just as our volume increases. 
that we try to prioritize the letters that are requesting for specific material. Um, but the goal overall is just to respond to every person that writes us. And we have on our order form, if people have written us before or maybe received an order form from someone else that they know, there's an area on there to, to specifically let us know like what degree of discreet do we need to be? Um, is our name itself potentially problematic, in which case we'll send out under something else? Or just is there no like nudity allowed on the cover of a book or something like that? So it's pretty case by case. Um, the default is always to be as discreet as possible. I will say that a, a common question that I've been asked many times is how do you deal with, uh, you know, when you're dealing with incarcerated people, how do you deal with and send books inside to people who are convicted of crimes that you believe may be morally reprehensible? And I think that the easy answer for me was always that, well, I don't know if they committed that crime or not. I only know that they were charged with that crime and that they were convicted of that crime. I don't know any of the personal circumstances. I'm not here to judge what those circumstances were. And I'm quite well aware that there are many people in positions of power who've committed crimes uh, that have affected far more people to a far greater degree that will never see the inside of an institution, not that I want anyone to be incarcerated. Uh, but that said, right, it's not it's not our job to make that assessment, right? It's our job to give people those access to that material uh, to help them get through uh, their life on the inside. Hey, Mac, uh, you had to talk about, um, you know, uh, a rejection rate um, on some of the mailings. Do you have any uh, information on confiscation rates? once a prisoner has received books, um, like how, how many of them are allowed to ultimately keep them? I, mean, I can't answer, but. I, I'll say, I, I don't have like, we definitely don't have data, um, but anecdotally, like people will, usually if they're allowed to get the book in the first place, like they're allowed to have it, but then there will be these like mass confiscation events and people will usually like write to us about it afterwards, be like, hey, can I get more books? They came through and like tossed everyone's cells and took all of our stuff. Um, so yeah, it's very anecdotal. Like it definitely happens, but um, I think it's less frequent. Usually if they don't want them to have them, they just won't give it to them in the first place. You want to chime in on that? It's pretty much the same story. Um, yeah, I've only heard anecdotal stories about that after the fact. And But something we run into occasionally is when someone knows that they weren't able to receive our package, so they write us again, but we don't know what we sent them in the first place because um, we don't keep keep data on that. It's always a little bit sad. I just have a question about the book itself. I'm just curious because I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Obviously, I just got it. I, I, I have a copy right now. <laughs> um, but it looks like an amazing text full of all sorts of different types of information, including some data from over the years and then personal anecdotal stories and all of that. And I'm just curious, how long did it take to put the book together? And do you have any stories to tell about deciding to make the book and how it kind of how it came together? Sure, that's a like great a big project. That's that's a great question. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, so the long and short of it is, is that uh, Moira and I had a prison books program that we were running in Saxball, North Carolina, and we got contacted uh, by a man I knew at uh, UGA Press, and we were specifically serving the state of Georgia, and he inquired. He said, "Well." You know, we run the largest press and we're the you know university press in Georgia. It seems like we can maybe be of assistance. Can we get you all some books or you know, how how can we help basically? 
And then the idea quickly was like, well, the biggest thing we could do is let people know about prison books programs because there are so many people that just don't know that these programs exist even in their own towns. And so it quickly moved to the idea that, you know, we needed to write a book. And thankfully the press was very interested in the idea right from the get-go. And then it was a matter of, you know, figuring out uh, who could write chapters, what, what would be the focus and all that kind of, you know, some of that's dictated by who says yes, right? right. You know, um, there were people that we wanted their participation, but they were, you know, busy or it just wasn't working out for another reason. Um, but I think that we got a really good collection and we, we got a diversity of stories. I personally, yes, I think we, we would have liked more of the origin stories, more of those. I'm still collecting some of those. And uh, I just found out that Big House Books in Mississippi owes their origins directly to, um, they can be attributed to the prison books program in Carborough, North Carolina, which comes out of Asheville prison books. <laughs> So again, you know, that legacy, you know, continues on um, from these from these programs and shows the interconnection of the programs. The book itself, the style was, artists are such an important part of the movement and we didn't want to separate the art from the stories. And we understand that it's it's a difficult topic and incarceration isn't, you know, it's, it's hard for people to deal with all at once sometimes. And so we wanted to make it something that you could pick up and put down, right? That, the, so the coffee table style text was something that just naturally kind of we gravitated toward and uh and so that process kind of seemed it just that seemed like such a good fit and we wanted that art to be incorporated throughout the text and not separated kind of a reflection of how the movement is in reality right mm -hmm. the artists are part of the movement not separated from it um so thanks for that i hope i answered the question Oh, for sure. When did you start the project? I'm just curious, like, how many years has it been in the works? You... Uh, it seems like 20. Right. <laughs> but uh, but I think that um, I would say I think it was about four years. I think. Yeah. I could be wrong on that. It looks like a lot of work. <laughs> how do you guys put the metal files in the books? <laughs> we, I was going to talk to you about that later. Went back that night. <laughs> who, who funds the digital, like the tablets and the digital library, and do they have to pay for it? And like, what's that whole scene about? Good question. That really, so you have to think about the whole. That is a. Big question that at the end of the day, the carceral system in the United States is huge, right? And so you have the federal system and there's multiple tiers of the federal system. Each state has its own system. Then there's ICE and so on and so forth. There's over 6,000 institutions of incarceration in the United States in total, right? And so some of those tablets are provided by the states themselves. Um, but the, the biggest thing about access, they're private corporations that are, that are kind of making the money yeah. from that, right, at the end of the day. Um, and the tablets themselves, they're being used. There's, I think that there's probably a place for tablets, but it's about, with any, like anything else within the prison system, it's about control and access, yeah. right? Who, has, who ultimately has control over those tablets? What can be on them? And do they come at the exclusion of other things as well, right? Like, so do, do you get tablets and then therefore you're not allowed to have hard copies of books because you have the tablet? It shouldn't come at the exclusion of something else, right? Um, and there's another, there's a human, a very human aspect of something that we try to get at in the book of when the books even get inside, right? The continuing to lend your books out. Actually, I was wondering, Martin Socher, was that was one of the things he was in trouble for was lending out his law books, right? So even going back to some of the people that you know we can look to as the origins of these programs, the the lending out of your books is is kind of a very personal thing, and I think uh, two of the incarcerated people we interviewed talk about that aspect that they would you know that was a big deal for them, mm -hmm. to, you know, it fosters a sense of community on the inside, and so to not people I don't foresee people lending out their tablets in the same manner, right? And then there's tracking systems about, you know, determining what you read, you're reading, all these things that 
people on the inside or not necessarily, and even on the outside for that matter, in, in the general public, right? But we're not generally excited about uh, people tracking uh, how we interact with our reading material in that manner. And, and I'll add on the economic tip, you asked like, who's funding it? The families, the loved ones. I mean, they're paying for this mm -hmm. stuff, you know, tens, sometimes hundreds of dollars a month. Not all of them, like usually, like Mac was saying, the system's so uh, jurisdictionally fragmented that it's like really different from place to place. But so in some places you'll have them be like mostly free. In other places they'll have to pay by the minute. It's mostly like pay by minute. Um, and there's like different types of content. Uh, you know, there's a whole, you have to pay money for it to put songs on it. And then there's like a different bucket of money to put for the law library. And there's a different book of money for audio. I mean, it's like crazy. It's exactly what you would think like capitalism would do with <laughs> this pro this project. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just uh, egregious predatory rates for content um, and loved ones and families you know that's when they start coming to us is when they're like my family can't pay for me to get this stuff anymore whether it's a physical book or whether it's on the tablet like we're just tapped out but one good piece of news securus went under or is very close to being bankrupt yeah. <laughs> which if folks are interested in reading how the 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 demise of a prison telecom giant uh, happened. You can read, there's a great article on the appeal.org uh, or .com that describes how activists help bring down Securus, which is just one of these big evil telecom companies. And there's one waiting to take its place, Like, but it's good to know the playbook of how to undercut those kinds of uh, predatory corporations. And in terms of other you know, good news, there have been moves in certain states to uh, reduce the cost of phone calls and things for incarcerated people, right? So there are things, you know, as overwhelming as it is at times, right? There are, there are some, there are some victories. Um, and one that is not, and some of these victories aren't public knowledge, right? They're, they're things that we don't always know the history of. For instance, I'm aware that there is a, was a recent prison strike and it didn't receive national attention. And the only reason I'm not mentioning the name specifically is because I don't want to, it's their story to tell and I don't want to adversely affect the uh, communication network that they've established. But I know for a fact that part of the demands of the incarcerated people were access to better access to books and better books, mm -hmm. right? They wanted more and better books. And I know that the demands were met and they got so, you know, there are some good stories out there. It's always good to remember that action works. We've got a question from the from remote viewers, of whom there are about ten. So, kind of cool. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, someone tuning in um, asked uh, if um, folks know roughly what the gender breakdown is between the facilities that your respective programs are sending books into and whether or not it's more or less common to send to men's prisons versus women's prisons. And also, as long as I'm taking up space, there's also a request that if panelists could repeat questions from the audience, folks weren't really able to hear the questions. Thank you for mentioning that. That's a good note. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if the use of the microphone matters to folks who are tuning in, but nobody has said that they can't hear, so I'm going to assume that everybody can hear. If anybody can't hear, they should type a message that says they can. <laughs> Liza, I'd be interested in your answer to this question because I feel like it's probably different from ours. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I don't have a statistic on that or like a hard number. Um, we definitely receive far, far, far more letters from male institutions. Um, but as far as paying attention to like the actual breadth of gender diversity that we receive mail from, like that runs the gamut. Um, so I, I would guess that it's probably some, as far as like male prisons versus female prisons, somewhat comparable to just those populations in, in general, yeah. like the, the way that we receive letters from both. I, I should note real fast that 
the there isn't an equal proportion of incarcerated of people incarcerated by gender right that males are overwhelmingly more likely to be incarcerated so that that is you're already working with a discrepancy um, or a difference there yeah and i would say that our our numbers pretty much reflect that again i don't have like specific data but yes far more from men's facilities than women's facilities um although i do know that um at least in the last few years like black women have been the most uh have been the highest level of increasing rate i mean it's still like low compared to men but it's the it's the demographic group with the most increase in incarceration so you know they're saturated in the male market so we're going over to the women um and one thing that's interesting for us that we've noticed with the women's facilities is we get these letters that have like 16 requests in one envelope do y'all get that too it's so interesting and it makes me wonder right it could be something logistically about how the prison is organized that it's like easier for the women for whatever reason maybe they have like less locked down and so they can like share more freely or something um or maybe they're not getting as many supports so they don't have as much stamps or something in my mind I do go to that space of like, it's probably just because like women are better at sharing. <laughs> and so there's like more mutual aid happening is always has always been my guess, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, but it is cool to see how uh, inside there's a recognition that like, okay, we've got limited resources. How can we optimize that for the, you know, the most benefit for, for everyone? Anyone in? Oh yeah, go for it. Well, I was going to ask. Um, I know I've heard Prison Bus Projects talk about uh, needing to provide receipts that the material that they're being sent was actually purchased by them. And I wonder if you could talk about the expectation that facilities have that prisoners have the money to be able to pay for a book that they're receiving. If that's a regular thing or just like institution by institution. So the question from the audience <laughs> was. <laughs> Uh, oftentimes we provide receipts for books showing that the prisoner paid for the book, even though they never do. Um, and so is that specific to institutions or is that like across the board? What are the expectations of the uh, facilities that people are paying for these books? Good question. I, I can answer that when we started National Prison Books and this continued on with the other prison books programs I was associated with, we always just included a receipt and we always just put cash due, nothing, but there was an actual receipt in there or paid on the receipt. And then that way, I mean, somebody paid for the book at some point in time. <laughs> and, and that's how, you know, we just, we, we tried to deal with that just very bureaucratically. Uh, at that time, uh, it's just include receipts by nature, by default, right? Is that because some facilities, there's an expectation that the prisoner has to have paid for the thing that they're receiving? Maybe I missed something. Yeah. Is that why? If they're not supposed to have it if they didn't pay for it or something? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's it gets complicated because again it's each institution right might right. have a differing reason and then to make matter right I said that there are these different levels of jurisdiction but then even within those different jurisdictions it oftentimes comes down to the interpretation of an individual's of an individual institution's policies right. by the individual guard in the bail room. Right. So how they interpret that. So it may say that, you know, they may require that the books be new. Right. And so therefore a new book should have a receipt or that, you know, they they don't want to believe that you are giving something to an incarcerated person. Right. That this has to be purchased. Um, that is actually, you know, something that some institutions, they, they want to know that it was purchased and not given. Uh, so. You know, it really runs, it, it just depends upon each individual institution in general in terms of how those things get interpreted. So it, it is the assumption then that, that, that like, you know, because of what, what you're saying there, well, why would someone give something to somebody in jail that that person had to? 
bought it because obviously if they're giving it to them, then there's something in this. Well, so I think it's there's a few things happening, right? There's the they're letting us send the books in based on the idea that we're like legitimate. Because notably, friends and family, like you just as an individual can't just send in a book, despite all these lawsuits and everything that's been done, individuals can't just send books, they can, you know, buy it from Amazon and have it shipped there or buy it from Firestorm and have it shipped there. But you can't from your own home address, just like send someone a book, we can. Um, because there's this idea over time, we're like grandfathered in to this legitimacy. Um, so I think part of that kind of legitimacy theater is that money changed hands. Right. It's not necessarily a term. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was I, that, that's not fully my line. I, I changed it a little bit, but whenever someone at Prison Books probably a decade ago taught taught me that phrase, probably Moira, um, the phrase security theater. And that right. and that's what it is. Um, so it's not like a hard and fast rule necessarily for every or even for any that you had to buy it, but there's an assumption that if you bought it, there's some kind of legitimacy mm -hmm. that that is attendant there, um, some kind of accountability. And that mm -hmm. accountability also goes the other way. Like I like to put it on there because I feel like they're less likely to just throw it away mm -hmm. if they think that money changed hands because then they're liable for you know destroying goods that were sold or something. Um, it doesn't work most of the time, but, <laughs> but even if it just helps a little bit, uh, there's that. And then I think there's also, um, yeah, I don't know. Well, <laughs> I have a question. How are you, or how are these organizations interacting with the bureaucracy? I mean, are you making phone calls to wardens or administrators or politicians or all of these things? Or is that even risky to to take your movement public in that manner. So the question is, uh, how much interaction directly are we having with the prison apparatus? Yeah, the, prison apparatus, government, whatever that looks like, mm -hmm. the corporation. Sure. Um, I would say that most of that on our end is either in our like, verification process or in our processing returns process. So at the front or the back end of like the cycle of getting people books, um, by verifying letters, that's like confirming whether someone's still at that location or if they've been moved. People get moved around a surprising amount. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're sending to the right address. And also trying to check what sort of restrictions an institution has before we mail anything and then have to pay for it to be returned. Um, it is surprisingly difficult to call the prison and like get clarification on what their restrictions are. Often it's limited to like a certain day of the week or a certain time. Um, and what you were saying about how it really depends on one individual's interpretation that day, I have seen that for sure when I'm able to call some or talk to a person. And it usually feels really tangible and useful, but what they say one day could be different by the time we're mailing them a letter and who was opening those packages that day in that email room. So it, is very opaque and very like designed to be hard to communicate with them. Um, usually the only reason we are is to try to check like what are their policies and their restrictions on. I think it's worth noting that there is a vast for, uh, diversity in terms of like how different prison book projects uh, approach this. So like, we're at Firestorm right now. We've got a cross section of people who are probably a little bit more on the like grassroots and radical kind of edge of this. Um, there are definitely bigger projects that are 501c3s that are more, um, a little more integrated. And I mean, they're still independent of the prisons, um, but they have maybe like a less adversarial relationship um, and more. And we're not dogmatic about it. Like there's times when we have to call prisons. There's times when we have to, you know, 
be polite and try to be pragmatic about getting our goals met, getting our books in and stuff like that. And we do that, um, you know, up to a point, but uh, there's definitely a, a variety of different approaches that organizations will take, where there's like organizations that have someone who's you know, constantly in conversation and even sometimes like planning a little bit with, you know, and they're very much, they are very legitimized in the eyes of the administrations and they like have people who they talk to all the time. And, you know, so there's our answers, but then there's also the representation of like the whole right. books to prisoners movement is really different. I don't want to be mindful of folks this time. So maybe if we have one more question, then we'll continue informally. If There's one on the computer. Right. They say, can y'all talk about the work y'all did with community to get back into Anson? Mm. And if you've noticed any difference in sending materials there since then? Great. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I think this question is uh, about a specific action that we had to take when we were told uh, that we were banned from Anson Correctional, which is a, a women's facility. And um, it was it was a pretty immediate response on our part. We started calling and we have gotten banned and unbanned from institutions in the past by mounting like calling campaigns basically and a little bit of media attention. Um, and that's usually been effective. There's only one institution that we have not been able to get unbanned from. Uh, but Anson, we were able to actually leverage the energy behind the um, banned books week that they did um, and kind of as part of the, we had tried, we had done our own small little call-in campaign when we first got banned from there and it didn't really work. They were still pushing back. And then uh, we used the opportunity of that, uh, that's what it was called, right? Banned Books Week, mm -hmm. um, which is national in scope. And we're able to kind of jump off of the energy of that to have people call and that got it done. Um, or or actually, I yeah, I followed up with them afterwards and they said, oh, we're not like, you're not banned at all. And I and I sent them pictures of five different packages that all say not approved vendor, not approved vendor. And I said, this. And they were like, they were like, okay, I'm gonna check it out. And then the next day they were like, you're good. So that was like community power call in and just following up and not letting it drop. Do you guys have any legal help? Like, like if you need to call a lawyer and ask for something to sit You know what's up? No. We would love to have that. It's an area of growth for the project. I'll probably run into one. <laughs> Please let us know. What about there, so I know that we, as such, uh, prison books, we did um, work to give books to juvenile facilities, but that was not through individual letters. That was more wholesale into the facilities. Um, but they, that's that is a whole nother avenue and a whole nother ball of wax. But I think we're going to go ahead and and wrap this part up, and we can continue to meet informally. I do want to say once again, thank you to my uh, fellow panelists here. And I I want to say thank you to, or that this project couldn't have been done without my co-editor Moira, all the contributors uh, to the various chapters, right? All the people who wrote, all the people who have uh, fought for the rights of incarcerated people and all the artists who donated their time. So it's really, the whole thing is really a, a community effort, group effort. And thank you all for coming and we'll talk to you soon.